me start my video. All right, so normally this is um, where we would start our spectroscopy discussion because we, we completed like the air matter. And then we got one more section after this. It's just a big section with a lot of reactions in it. Uh, but normally this is where we would start our spectroscopy discussion. So we would, from here for the next, this week and next week, uh, we're gonna have a discussion on NMR, right? So NMR and then mass, uh, not mass spec, uh, infrared. Uh, we're gonna leave out mass spectrometry for the sake of time. <clears throat> but I will say this and I'll even, I'll put this in the chat so you can have it in your notes. So NMR is It tells us about the carbon hydrogen framework. Infrared tells us about functional groups. Uh, mass spec, size and molecular formula. And then uh, UV tells us whether or not there are conjugated pot systems present. So these, these methods are like your typical methods for your typical methods for characterization. So anytime you make an organic compound, you got to characterize it, right? You have to have a way to, to uh, conclusively determine that that's what you made. So NMR is one of those methods. Uh, is You can actually use NMR coupled with the other uh, methods to de actually determine the structure of an unknown compound, right? If you if you just have a, uh, you have an idea of what you made, you can actually, and you have a molecular formula, you can basically construct a compound based on the NMR. All right, so what, what NMR teaches us are these four things, right? This is what we're gonna focus on. Non how many non-equivalent hydrogens are present, meaning how many different types of hydrogen are on that molecule, right? That's one of the main, that's the main thing that it, that we're gonna focus on. Uh, the second is where they're located, what the chemical environment is. So is it upfill or is it downfill? Upfill meaning uh, towards zero, downfill meaning away from zero. And upfill and downfill is very nuanced. It can be, uh, let's say you have a, a signal at uh, one parts per million uh, if you, if it moves to 0 0.999, that would be considered an upfield shift. Uh, if it moves to 1.01, that's a downfield shift. So it's very nuanced. It's not, it's not always like large increments where the signal shift, but upfield and downfield is important because upfield protons are in electron rich environments and then downfield protons are in electron poor environments. So that, that tells us a lot about where a particular type of proton is located. And then uh, you can tell how many of each type of hydrogen is present, right? So if, I, <clears throat> if we're talking about this molecule right here, and we're looking at this set of protons, right? <laughs> the signal for that, we should be able to integrate that signal. That's what the process is called, integration. We should be able to integrate that signal and it should integrate for three protons. By the same token, this signal right here, I should be able to integrate that signal and it should integrate for one proton because there's only one hydrogen there, right? So the number of each type of hydrogen you can determine uh, and then the neighboring hydrogen. So what's next door to what? Like how do you connect the carbons to to, to get the signals that you see at, at the with the same or with the proper uh, multiplicity. We're going to talk about Dr. all Dr. Russell. Yes. Is this PowerPoint on Blackboard? Uh, yes. If not, it will be today. I can't remember if I put the updated one on there or not, but it's definitely in uh, course in the course documents folder. Uh, 
a ver one version of it. All right. So again, number of non-equivalent signals, right? For the chemical environment and the number of each type of hydrogen and what they're connected to, what the carbons, where those hydrogens are residing uh, or connected to. So even if we look at this right here, how many signals do you see in this spectrum, right? Not lines, because some of the signals are not just one line, which we're gonna talk about later, but how many signals do you see here? Two. Okay, that's, that's a good answer. It's not the right answer, but it's a good answer. You got two signals here. You have two signals here, and then you got one signal here. So you have a, a total of five signals. Are you following? The signal is just the, if there's a peak somewhere on the, on the uh, spectrum, what we call it a signal. So we got one, two, three, four, five signals. Yes or no? Yes. What that means. Sorry, I thought you meant by the two lines, like the, by the two. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <clears throat> what that means, if we have five signals, what that means is that we have five types of hydrogens in that molecule. And you can look at it and see five different types, right? So you have this CH3 that's going to give a signal. Can y'all see my cursor? So you have this CH3 that's going to give a signal. You have these protons right here. There's two hydrogens on that carbon that's going to give a signal. And then you have the CH3 over here that's gonna give a signal. You have the CH3 here that'll give a signal and then this hydrogen here. So each one of these signals represents one of these hydrogens or one of these sets of hydrogens on this molecule. All right, and any questions about that? So that's, the, that's how we know how many non-equivalent hydrogens are present by the number of signals. And then we know what they're connected to by the number of lines that signal is split into. Right, and then we know the environment based on where they are on the molecule because every type of proton is going to be in a, a specific type of environment that we can. <clears throat> we're going. I'm gonna show. I have a chart that I'll show you with all the different uh, chemical shifts on it. All right. Any questions about anything so far? All right. So NMR, if you took <coughs> organic one, then you've heard of this before, right? Because we did NMR of aspirin and um, we were able to figure out which signals in aspirin showed up where uh, when, when we did that little exercise. But the term or the acronym NMR is, a, is an acronym for what we call nuclear magnetic resonance. So the, and we're, we're gonna talk about how it works just slightly how it works for in a second. So we got NMR and it uses every uh, hydrogen nucleus has its own magnetic field. So what NMR does is it uses that pre-existing magnetic field to generate a signal, right? By perturbing it with an external magnetic field. Uh, and what it tells us about, again, I put this in the chat, but I'll say it now again, it tells us about the carbon hydrogen framework of a molecule. And before I go further, there are multiple types of the NMR. You can do proton, which is what we're gonna be talking about, where you look at the hydrogen. You can do carbon NMR, where you look at the carbons in a molecule. Uh, you can do uh, fluorine NMR. You can do uh, silicon NMR. I and mean, there's a lot of different types of NMR um, spectroscopy that you can do and it just depends on the type of probe you have in your instrument. Uh, so the graph of an NMR or the spectrum as we call it, is intensity versus chemical shift. <clears throat> the chemical shift is the term used for location. So that's the term what we use to talk about location, right? We say that uh, this particular proton has a chemical shift of two parts per million, right? That's the, that's the scale on the X axis, it's, parts, it's in parts per million. Um, and we, when we write chemical shift, we use the little uh, lowercase Greek delta shown right here. 
All right, and then so if you got chemical shift data, the way you calibrate your NMR is using TMS, tetramethylsilane, right? That uh, tetramethylsilane is a silicon atom with four methyl groups around it, four CH3 groups around it. Those uh, protons show up at zero, right? And so every NMR spectrum is calibrated based on TMS. So that's your zero point. If you, you know for a fact that all of those hydrogens on that uh, TMS show up at zero, everything else is relative to that. Now you've already seen the, the instrument if you took lab and um, when we did when we went in and actually uh, ran the NMR of aspirin. Uh, so you have your sample, which you put in the NMR tube, which is shown right here, a little glass tube, thin glass tube, uh, dissolve it up in a deuterated solvent because you need the do you need the instrument to lock on a signal that's not one of your hydrogens or your molecules? So that's why you use deuterium. Um, and then you put the tube in the magnet, and it, uh, usually up here somewhere there's a little opening where you can sit it in, sit the tube in a spinner, and then sit it in there, and it's held up by compressed air until it's time to drop it down into the uh, into the instrument. And then <clears throat> what NMR uses is RF energy, radio frequency energy. So there's a big superconducting magnet inside this canister and it uses this RF energy uh, to perturb the, mag the existing magnetic field of the nucleus that you're investigating. In our case, it's gonna be hydrogen, right? So we talked about this already, we'll just revisit it and I'm gonna show you the theory. So every hydrogen nucleus has its own magnetic field. Right, and then the nuclei have random spins, right? Those magnetic fields, they have random spins, the nuclei have random spins. So when you put it in the presence of an external magnetic field, some of your nuclei, they're gonna line up with the field, some will line up against it. And so that's the that's how you perturb the pre-existing magnetic field by putting it, in, dropping the, the sample down to a magnet a magnet is normally a, a huge uh, superconducting 400 megahertz or 300 megahertz or high, whatever the strength, the field strength is. When you drop your sample down in there, the, the nuclei that's being investigated is going to either line up with that magnetic field of the instrument or against it. So it kind of looks like this. All right, so you have the random spins over here. You put, put it in uh, the magnetic field of the of the instrument and then you can see the magnetic field is going here to the right right this it's just arbitrary and then some of your spins are going to line up going the same direction as that magnetic field but some aren't right i always use the the analogy of like the spins that don't line up those are like the kids in kindergarten that won't stop talking and so the teacher have to do something to get them to stop talking so that's the rf radiation that's the purpose of that so when you pulse it with the RF radiation, it makes those spins line up for momentarily. So that's how you go from, from here to here. And then what happens is in between pulses, they relax back, right? So you pulse them and then they relax back. You pulse them and they relax back. You keep doing that. And every time it goes from with the field to relaxing back against the field gives off energy. That nucleus, that proton is going to give off uh, energy. And that's what's picked up by the instrument. All right. Any questions about that? So the, the instrument is basically whipping the non-compliant proton nuclei into compliance. But then, of course, as soon as you stop, then they relax back to their previous state. So every time that happens, that relaxation it is going to give off energy. And then that, that gets picked up by the NMR detector and you record it as what's called a free induction decay, all right? So that's what this is on the left. It's a graph, right? It's basically a graph uh, in seconds. You see on the x-axis that it's in seconds. And you can convert that into a readable spectrum using a Fourier transform, right? This is all high-level calculations uh, 
and you don't have to do this by hand. You just hit a button on the instrument and it'll convert that FID into a uh, readable spectrum. All right. And any questions about that? All right, so, so for characterization purposes, NMR is probably, for the organic chemists, is probably the most powerful tool we have uh, to figure out <clears throat> what we made or confirm what we made. Because a lot of times when you're doing a synthesis, you go into it knowing like what you're trying to get to. So the NMR is either going to confirm it or it's going to tell you, you know, you got something else and you need to rethink that. Uh, so yeah, if you have an idea of what you're trying to make and you know where the, where the signal should show up. <clears throat> and so if that's the case, then when you look at the NMR, it should match what your, what your assumption is. Otherwise, you, have, you either haven't made it or you made some derivative product or something like that. All right, so we're gonna look at a, um, a quick reaction. Uh, this electrophilic addition of HBr. You know this, you've seen this HBr reaction to a double bond uh, in part one, right? And so from this example, what we're going to look at are several things. We're going to look at um, where the signals are, how many signals we get, how, how many um, protons each signal integrates for, all right? And the splitting patterns, like how those signals, what those signals look like and why they're not just single line. So here, down here, we have some information. We got the molecular weight. We have a, a mass spec analysis. And again, what mass, I'm gonna send you a, a, a short video on mass spec since we're not gonna have time to actually physically discuss it. But it's, it's a, a simple concept. What you do is you take a molecule, you bombard it with an electron beam and shatter it. Basically, you, you split it apart at the different bonds, right? And so uh, what mass spec is gonna tell you, number one, is gonna confirm the molecular weight. And then number two, <coughs> it's going to uh, give you all the different fragments that that particular molecule can be broken into. So that's why you got all these masses down here. Uh, you got 418, four, that's, and so one of, the, one of the things you look for is uh, what you call the M plus one peak in a mass spec. So that's 418 is the mass. The mass plus one will be 419. So that's always going to be in your mass spec. And then the fact that you have a halogen present for this molecule, you also have what's called an M plus two peak. Uh, it, those are your isotope peaks. So that's why you see this uh, signal or peak at 420 in the mass spec. And then in the infrared, we're going to take a day um, a couple of days to talk about infrared, just not right now. We're going to talk about it later. But in your infrared, uh, this tells you what functional groups are present, and it also uh, kind of gives you an idea of um, it's basically measuring either the stretching, the bending, or the twisting of a particular bond at a as it absorbs energy at a particular wavelength. So we're going to talk about that later. All right. So here's the reaction star material product on the right and so now let's add let's talk about this question right this first question where do the signals come from and when we think about the nmr signals right again how many how do we know or how many sit what 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 does the number of signals in the spectrum tell us about the actual molecule like what, what does that mean? Like if I say I have 10 signals in a NMR spectrum, what does that mean for the actual molecule itself? Did you say it was something relating to the hydrogen? Say that again. Did you say it was something related to the hydrogen? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, it's the number of non-equivalent sets of protons, right? That's what the number of signals tells me. All right, so when I look at that molecule, you can see I have them color coded, right? <clears throat> so this is a this is a CH three. So these hydrogens are going to show up. These hydrogens should show up here, 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 
and then here, right? These will be equivalent. And I'm gonna talk about that uh, in a second. Like, how do you know if something is equivalent or not? All right, so that's a, that should be a total of one, two, three, four, five, six signals, yes? So you count like the group, like the two as one? Yes, as a group, yes. Because they're, they're the same, they're, they're both, the, like these two protons will be equivalent, but they're not equivalent to anything else in the molecule. So that's why we call them non-equivalent. But yes, so to see it, these two protons are, will be counted together. Same with these, 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 the three here will be counted together. And then the three here are also counted together. And they just happen to be equivalent to this set right here. That's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. Somebody ha had that question, but they were scared to ask it. All right. So if we look at the spectrum, we can see one, two, three, four, five, six signals. Is that right? So the signals are generated by the different sets of non-equivalent protons. this right quick. All right, questions about that? So when we look at the equivalence or the non-equivalence, I thought I had fixed that. The equivalence or non-equivalence, that's a way we can test for that too, right? So if we look at, let's say, uh, these two sets of protons right here here and here, right? The way I test for equivalence is by replacing one of them with a, another atom, right? Let's say chlorine. So if I put a chlorine here, or if I put a chlorine here and I compare the two structures that I get, if they're not the same, then that means that those protons are non-equivalent. Does that make sense? Yes. Right? That's my test for equivalence. Well, I wanna compare any protons in here. All I need to do is, let's say I wanna compare these two. If I take off this proton and replace it with another atom, and then I take off one of these and put another atom here, and I, I, I take those two structures, put them side by side. If I get two different compounds, then they're not equivalent. But here, you can see right here, if I put a chlorine here in the place of one of these, or in the place of one of these, I'm going to get the exact same compound. Yes or no? Yes. Mm -hmm. You get the same compound. So that's why these two are equivalent. And that's why they show up at the same signal. Let me see if I can get this animation Right, so I can show you which one corresponds to which. Let's see. All right, now I might be able to edit it. and then protect it. I'll tell you what, what Microsoft is on my 
on this. Let me see. Emotion. Okay, so now if we look at the, the arrows here, the color coded arrows, right? So you can see the this set of protons here is here. Russell, there's nothing on the screen. All right, hold up. All right, can you see it now? Yes. All right. All right, <clears throat> so you can see here, right? All the pro we color coded it. I color coded it on purpose so I could show you where the signals show up. So the red, the red protons here or here, and then you have uh, the blue arrow corresponding to the blue protons, the pink arrow corresponding to pink, and then teal here, and then yellow here. It's kind of orange up here, but it's, this is an arrow for it right here. And then the black arrow for these, this CH3 out here. So let me ask this question while we do, while we're looking at this. If I ask you for this signal and I ask you how many protons that signal represented, what, do, what would you say? So look at the arrow. It's the orange set that's up here. How many protons are here? Two. Two. So that signal. When I integrate that signal, it's gonna integrate for two protons. What about here? The black signal, which is right here. How many hydrogens are there? Three. Three, so that signal will count for three protons. What about here? Six. Six, good, very good. It's both of these sets are the same. We just said that they're both equivalent. So that's gonna be six protons. And then the pink will be two. The teal one would also be two. And then the blue set would also be two. Does that make sense? Yes. So we see where the signals come from. They, the, every every non-equivalent proton is gonna give you a signal of its own, all right? And then here's the, this just talks about the test for equivalence. You just take a hydrogen off and replace it with, um, with another atom, right? Normally I just use chlorine, but it can be whatever you want to use, right? And if some, if, if a set of protons are equivalent, we call them homotopic. If they're non-equivalent, we call them heterotopic. All right, so now we add, now here's another question. Why do they show up in certain places, right? Why do these signals show up upfield or downfield or wherever they are, right? And so, the chemical shift is going to be based on the environment. If it's in an electron poor environment, then it's going to show up downfield. If it's in, a, in an electron rich environment, it's going to show up, down, show up upfield, which is closer to zero. So towards zero is upfield and away from zero is downfield, right? So here you got your downfield signals. You can have uh, hydrogens that are attached to sp2 carbons, or if they are adjacent to electronegative atoms, they're going to be downfield. If it's just a simple sp3 carbon with no uh, inductive electronegative atoms around it, then it's going to be upfield. So let's look at it again. Right, so you can see Right, you can see again, these numbers correspond to the chemical shift of each one of those protons or each set of protons, right? And let me put the arrows back in. So now you can see here, you got the blue set showing up at 1.29, the teal set at 1.51. And even if we didn't know the, the 
which protons were which, we could figure that out with the splitting pattern, which we're going to talk about shortly. Uh, so yeah, the pink set at 1.71. Uh, the set here, the CH3, that's at one, um, I'm sorry, the two CH3s here at 1.84. And then 3.3 for the black set over here. And then the orange set is at 3.37, all right? So the re why did, let's talk about this. Let's talk about uh, why some are further downfield than others, right? So look at I the. I was let's just about to ask that because, like, why is it Bromine more downfield? Well, that's a great question, and you and you can, but you see here, this is at one point eight four for these protons. If this Bromine wasn't here, these things would show up somewhere around point nine or point eight. So that's a huge shift. But think about what causes the downfield shift? The term that we use to talk about protons moving, the signal moving downfield is called deshielding, right? So the electronegative atoms, they deshield the protons, they lessen uh, the influence of their magnetic fields. And so it shifts the, the signal downfield. But when you compare bromine to oxygen, which one is more electronegative? Oxygen. Oxygen. So it's going to have a, a greater deshielding effect. And make sure okay. you write that term down to deshielding. Let me put that in the chat. So that's called deshielding. So when you put an electronegative atom around a set of protons, it's going to cause that that signal to move downfield. Right. So oxygen is more electronegative, so it has a greater effect on the protons that are around it than uh, bromine. But but that is a big shift for those uh, methyl groups where bromine is, because normally just regular sp2 hybridized. I mean, I'm sorry, sp3 hybridized carbon protons that are on those types of carbons can they can show up anywhere from 0 0.1 to about one and a half. So that's a big shift. All right. Any questions about, about the location? Let's talk about it. So when you compare this set of protons right here, right? Notice the carbon where those protons are is adjacent to an oxygen. Right. That's why you see that signal all the way down here. I'm saying all the way like it's but relative to the other signals. That's why you see it all the way down here. Right. Because that oxygen is going to deshield those protons and make that signal show up further downfield. Same thing here. This carbon is connected to oxygen and the three protons that are on it are feeling the effect of oxygen's electronegativity. So that's why that set of protons shows up all the way down here. All right, y'all following that? Yes. All right, and then you look at the other sets of protons, you can see they're also down, shifted downfield from where they would normally be if there were no electronegative atoms present, all right? Way downfield. We're gonna, I, I have a chart that I'm gonna show you that has the different predicted chemical shifts on it. Right, but you can see here the blue set is here. Um, the teal set is here, and then the pink set is here. Now, the, you might have a question about why the blue is so is further upfield since it's closer to oxygen than this is to bromine. But it, I mean, it could be the fact that it could be how the chain is oriented, right? Because the protons that are next to bromine are immediately adjacent to it, right? But the, the blue set is not immediately adjacent to oxygen. It's one carbon removed from it. So that may be why it's here, right? Uh, and again, it, NMR is, a, is very nuanced, but it's also very precise. And so we know, for, we know without a doubt what's what in this spectrum because of the splitting pattern. So we're gonna talk about that in a second. All right, so when we look at the chemical shifts, if you just have a like a simple, again, sp3 carbon, the hydrogens that are on that carbon are going to be somewhere below two. 
So 1.9 all the way down to 0 0.1, somewhere up in there. The minute you put something next to that proton that is electronegative, like a sp2 hybridized carbon, if y'all remember from part one, when we talk about talked about how electronegativity and uh, hybridization go together. The, the higher the percent S character, the more electronegative the atom is. So a sp2 carbon is going to be more electronegative than a sp3, uh, and a sp is going to be more electronegative than sp2 because sp is 50% S, sp2 is 33% S. And the SP3 is 25% S. So when you when you start putting electronegative functional groups around those protons, it's going to cause a downfield shift. You see immediately, you go from zero to let's say 1.9. Uh, now that same proton with a sp2 carbon next to it shifts to between two and three. Right, that would be like an alpha proton to a carbonyl or some or something like that. All right. And then if you, if you have a functional group like an oxygen or a nitrogen or a halogen, those protons show up between three and five. This is precise, right? This is like they have to show up here. Sometimes they, it, it goes a little bit out of that range, but not very often. And that's a, that's a good way to tell what's connected to what by looking at the chemical shift. Right. If you see protons in that three to five range, then you know that there's, especially if you have a, a molecular formula that you're working with, even if you don't know the structure, you can kind of tell where the protons are based on, uh, or what functional groups they're close to based on the chemical shift. Right, and then like here, if you have a vinyl proton, like a proton that's on a uh, on an alkene, four and a half to six and a half always somewhere in that range uh your aromatic protons are always going to show up six and a half to eight uh your aldehyde protons are always going to show up between nine and ten right and then the acid proton which uh, if you remember taking the aspirin uh nmr we could see that acid proton at about ten and a half uh, but that can be anywhere from 10 to 12 for a carboxylic acid all right. Questions about about the chart. Now, this is this is something that you should definitely commit to memory, right? Because you're gonna you're gonna need to know this. Um, on the, I think on the exam, I may I think I give you like some of the chemical shifts or something like that. But definitely worth committing to memory if you're gonna see NMR again. Uh, it's worth knowing where where the uh, certain types of protons show up. All right, questions, any questions? Man, it's 9.55. Mm. All right. So I'm gonna wait. I don't wanna start uh, talking about splitting patterns yet. I'm gonna send you two videos after this so you can um, look at those to get ready for when, for, I keep saying it's, when, it's Friday, to get ready for Friday. Uh, so we're going to look at that. And then after that, after we cover the spin, spin splitting, we're going to start working problems because that's the best way to attack this is, is really, uh, more advantageous to, to just dive in and, and just jump in the water and start swimming as opposed to me just holding you on the side of the pool and telling you about it. So on Wednesday, we'll start working up the first set of problems, uh, with NMR and I'm trying to. I'm not, I'm not watering this down, but I am kind of paring it down so that we can actually get some good information without me rushing through it. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk again, we'll finish. We'll talk about spin splitting on Friday and then we'll start working some problems on Friday. All right, any question? any questions about anything? Yes, sir. Can you make a second attempt for the conjugated Diane's assignment? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a statement. I don't have a question. A statement? Ooh. Go ahead. Okay. So look at here. I was talking to my uh, co-worker. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. 
<laughs> Hold on, let me stop recording for 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 some incriminating. No, nothing incriminating. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. But I don't like our our conversations to be on YouTube. So 